Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Zhong Hun, for the kind introduction. Uh, thanks also to Monami for organizing this series of seminars and for making sure that in spite of the virtual environment, everything works perfectly, except for uh, the bit that I have to, to put to work. Um, I decided to speak on this vast topic today for two main reasons. One being that for quite a few years now, I've done work in linguistics, but also try to do a bit of sociology. And through this experience, I've come to realize that there are many interesting connections between the two subjects, and indeed some very deep connections that I would like to share with you and to get some feedback from you. Also, uh, this semester, I'm teaching a course on language and social interaction to majors of uh, sociology, to the sociology majors. Uh, so I feel like owe my students an explanation as to why they're being put through so much linguistics every week. Sorry about that. Okay, so here's an outline of uh, the talk. Uh, it'll be in three parts. Part one, I'll say a little about linguistics and sociology. Part two, I will contrast two uh, theories of language. And in part three, I will come back to the question of language and society, hoping to show that uh, there's a good uh, symbiosis between them. Okay, here's my argument, just to give you the conclusion first, okay? Uh, so first of all, I will argue that linguistics and sociology cannot afford to take the other one for granted, that language structure and social organization are but two sides of the same coin of human sociality, and that the two subjects have a lot to learn from each other. Okay, so part one. Uh, linguistics has been defined in many different ways, but one recurrent and even constant element is the idea of system. So, uh, for example, Saussure uh, defines uh, linguistics as, or, or language as a system of signs, and uh, Sapir defines language as a system of voluntarily produced sounds. So, in almost every case, this, is, uh, this uh, idea of system comes up. Uh, which in effect is the linguist ideal of abstracting an object of study from all the complications and messiness in the use of language in social situations. Uh, in the words of Moore and Carling in a, a very old book, uh, they said language is readily uh, uh, being perceived and uh, conceptualized by linguists as readily isolatable from its uses and characterizable as an independent and self-contained system. So that's the same as what I have just said just now. Uh, the idea of language as system has a long history. It goes back all the way to the ancient Greeks who invented grammar. Dionysius Thrax, the famous Greek grammarian, spoke of grammar as the practical knowledge of the general usages of poets and prose writers. So for Dionysius Thrax, grammar is essentially an idealization, but an idealization made to serve the purpose of rhetoric. Um, Quintilian, the well-known Latin grammarian, inherited and extended this line of scholarship and not only continued to present his Latin grammar as a propedeutic to the full and proper appreciation of literature in a liberal education, but also as a practical resource for the teaching and learning of Latin 
by non-speakers of the language throughout the vast territorial expanse of the ancient Roman Empire. This long tradition continued uninterrupted from antiquity to the modern and contemporary world. So Sia, for example, father of modern linguistics, is very much ingrained in the idea of language as a self-contained system. While it's true that Saussure's overarching conception of language and speech is actually very comprehensive and a very attractive one, it encompasses both language as a system as well as language use in social situations. When it comes to the actual theory and method, he actually devoted most of his energy to the study of the abstract systems. It's not surprising that Saussure is known for his contributions to the study of long and uh, not parole. In modern linguistics, lip service is often paid to the social context of language, but not much actual attention is paid to it. Chomsky, for example, makes a distinction between competence and performance, where performance is a bit of an inconvenience and not worth the linguist serious attention. Uh, in, in order to show how grammar or syntax for Chomsky is independent from meaning, and in fact, can do what it likes, if you like, uh, with no, need to refer to meaning, he made up this famous sentence called, the famous sentence here, uh, colorless green ideas leap furiously, which has become uh, a very well-known sentence uh, that serves that purpose. Uh, but some of you may say, but what of sociolinguistics and sociology of language? Don't these fields of study pay a lot of attention to social context? For example, William Leboff, who actually says sociolinguistics is really how linguistics uh, should be done. Um, they do, of course, and sociolinguists like William Leboff and others have made tremendous contributions to the development of a socially sensitive linguistics. Uh, to give you just one quick example to those of you who are not uh, as familiar with this field as others, here's Leboff's famous department store study in New York, where phonological variation is mapped against social structure. So the study concerned the use of uh, or the uh, pronunciation or the sounding of the consonant R in words like fourth and floor. So in New York, um, words like fourth and floor have basically two pronunciations, one with an R and one without. So uh, in Labov's study, he went around three department stores and uh, asked uh, as many shop assistants as he could find uh, about some merchandise that were being sold on the fourth floor. Um, and so, of course, he got a lot of answers from the uh, shop assistants, and he took uh, a record of you know, all the answers. And then after some uh, calculations, counting and tabulation, he found what we see here on the, on the graph, uh, a clear distribution, uh, a clear difference between the different department stores according to their social status. So the high status store has the largest number of R's, okay, pronunciations with the R, as opposed to the low status stores. Okay, so nevertheless, uh, even though 
this and many other studies that Labov carried out uh, have made a tremendous um, achievement uh, for our understanding of how language and social structure may be uh, related to each other. Uh, still, between the kind of social meaning that we're talking about here, for example, whether the R is sounded or not, and so on, and the multitude of meanings and actions that are experienced by all the shopkeepers and customers, not only in the New York department stores, but everywhere else, uh, the gap between the social meaning that we're talking about here and the vast uh, array of possibilities in the interactions that go on uh, is the phenomenal. So in the case of shopping, what I meant to say is imagine all the things that can get done through talk and body language and so on between the customers and the shop assistants. And we see how desperately far our final goal is in spite of Lebov's sterling efforts. So why have linguists and sociolinguists been taking social structure and social organization for granted? As we said just now, doing so allows the linguist to focus on and specialize in language as a system. It also allows them to stay away from the thorny issue of language use, where meaning is both key and a conundrum. So there's a question of method here that we will be talking about in the next slide. So in matters of meaning, I'm suggesting that we need to ask three questions. Uh, the what question, what is meaning and why is it important? The where question, where to find it? Where does it happen and how does it happen? And the how question, how to study it? This is the methodological question. This is actually the toughest one. Okay, so if we consider what some of the most influential linguists have said about meaning, we'll be surprised that they have not actually shown that much confidence or interest in it. For example, Bloomfield says the statement of meanings is the weak point in language studies and will remain so until human knowledge advances very far beyond its present state. So for Bloomfield, his answer to the what question is, Basically, we don't know, and we have to leave it to the biologists. Chomsky's answer, he says, meaning is a notoriously difficult notion to pin down and so on. And uh, if we're not careful and we pay too much attention to it, it will deal us a serious blow. So for Chomsky, answer is also, I don't know, and perhaps even I don't care. Of course, a lot of linguists and sociolinguists and semantics and pragmatics scholars do care, but few have actually addressed the two other issues that I raised just now, the where question and the how question. For example, uh, why are Chow, one of my uh, favorite linguists, uh, was very interested in, in uh, the uh, meanings of language. Uh, he was a bright and humorous student of Bloomfield's. On the question of meaning and context, he famously made up a tongue-in-cheek story to show how imagination can make Chomsky's sentence work and come to life. So here's the story. Because it's so good, I better read it out for you, okay? I have a friend who's always full of ideas, good ideas and bad ideas, fine ideas and crude ideas, old ideas and new ideas. Before putting his new ideas into practice, he usually sleeps over them to let them mature and ripen. However, when he's in a hurry, he sometimes puts his ideas into practice before they're quite ripe. In other words, while they are still green. 
Some of his screen ideas are quite lively and colorful, but not always, some being quite plain and colorless. When he remembers that some of his colorless ideas are still too green to use, he'll sleep over them or let them sleep, as he puts it. But some of those ideas may be mutually conflicting and contradictory. And when they sleep together in the same night, they get into furious fights and turn the sleep into a nightmare. Thus, my friend often complains that his colorless green ideas sleep furiously. In sum then, on the question of language and social organization, the linguists have been strong on form, but weak on meaning. To quote Fauconier and Turner in the book, The Way We Think, the linguist dilemma really is a reflection of the fact that the subject has been strong on form, but not, uh, but not on meaning. I realize that these are sweeping statements and I will readily acknowledge exceptions. For example, Fauconier and Turner have done a lot of work on cognitive semantics and you know, they're certainly an exception and many, many others. Still, I hope these generalizations will show us something that is worth learning about. We turn now to sociology and explain why I think sociology on its part has tended to take language for granted. In a symmetrical sort of way, sociology has been giving too little attention to language. As a mirror image to linguistic, sociology has been strong on meaning but weak on form, particularly language form. Again, this is a sweeping generalization and there are many exceptions, notably the symbolic interactionists and Irving Goffman and so on, but I will comment on this presently. The first thing to say about language in the context of sociological investigations is the data that we collect and use in our research. It turns out that in fact, most of that data comes in the form of language. So for example, we use social surveys, interviews, documents, and so on, and many other kinds of data, but they mostly come in the form of language, particularly if we conceptualize as I do, language as a much broader phenomenon than we usually think of it in terms of the documents and the conversations and so on. So if by language we mean not just written documents, but also face-to-face -face interaction, not just verbal language, but also sign language, not just words and phrases, but also body language, not just texts, but also visual images of all kinds, then there's hardly any sociological data that is not linguistic. Without language, in fact, in this broad sense, there will be no society as we know it. To use interview data as an example of what I've just said, to illustrate what I've just said, when studying particular cultural groups, researchers often interview members of these groups and use their analysis of the content or themes of the respondents' answers as data. But as we can see from this short clip taken from an interview with a group of punk rockers in the UK, what meaning should be identified in what the respondent says is to say the least extremely complicated. And one that at the very least should take into consideration the interview itself as the occasion of that of those verbal outputs. Okay, so here's the, a bit of a, a short clip from that interview. So I as the interviewer, okay, can you tell me something about yourself, your style and that? Um, what sort of thing? Well, how would you describe it? Uh, I don't know. Most people describe it as punk, I suppose. Okay, so it's taken by, from a paper by Wolfett and Woodicom. Uh, so the, the, the meaning of that is extremely complicated and certainly not something that you can easily uh, extract information from as representing uh, what the person thinks of as 
what we think of as punk rockers. What he thinks of it may be something quite different. Equally important is the role that language plays in the constitution of social structure and social organization. And indeed in the formation of social facts in the first place. How much attention has been given to these possibilities? How much has been written on this subject? Not much that I know of. Again, to just give two examples from the sociologists, I'm gonna show you two quotations from two of the most influential sociologists of all times, Max Weber and Emil Durkheim. So Weber says culture is a finite segment of the meaningless infinity of the world process, a segment on which human beings confer meaning and significance. Uh, so clearly there's a lot of um, importance attached to meaning. It's the basis of culture, it's the basis of human social life that separates itself from the rest, which is meaningless in this technical sense. Durkheim says about social facts, the objective reality of social facts is sociology's fundamental principle. So what does he mean by that? Uh, an example of it is his study of suicide, famous study of suicide. And this is what he says about his findings regarding uh, the study of suicide. Now that we know the factors in terms of which the social suicide rate varies, we may define the reality to which this rate corresponds and which it expresses numerically. So for Durkheim to be able to express this reality numerically turns it into a fact. And it does, obviously it is a fact, but perhaps for Durkheim, a, a, a scientific fact, a scientific fact, rather than a fact of everyday life. On the subject of the sociologist's lack of interest in language or talk, Alfred Schutz has this to say, and I quote, when sociologists speak of social interaction, they usually have in mind a set of interdependent actions of several human beings mutually related by the meaning which the actor bestows upon his action and which he supposes to be understood by his partner. He goes on to say, in any of these cases, the existence of a semantic system, be it the conversation of significant gestures, the rules of the game, or language proper, is simply presupposed as something given from the outset, and the problem of significance remains unquestioned. Suicide rate is a case in point. Is it a social fact? I suppose it is although it must at the same time be acknowledged that Durkheim's claims about the correlation between social integration and suicide rate is far from being universally accepted. But let's say it's a fact. What is the status of this fact? It's certainly a fact for Durkheim and those who agree with him, but unlikely to be a fact for the man or woman on the street, not likely to be a fact in their everyday life experiences. But on the other hand, suicide is a concept that we are familiar with in everyday life. We know what it means, and many of us probably know of people who have taken their own lives. So how do we square these different facts? One way of Understanding this is to come back to Schutz, who uses the concept of language and typification, which is quite useful, which I find quite useful. I quote him again, says, typifications on the common sense level emerge in everyday experience of the world as taken for granted without any formulation 
of judgments or of need propositions with logical subjects and predicates. They belong, to use a phenomenological term, to pre-predicative thinking, the vocabulary and the syntax of the vernacular of everyday life, sorry, of everyday language, represent the epitome of the typifications socially approved by the linguistic group. So, so that's one way of uh, looking at it is from the point of view of typification. And so of the three questions that we asked earlier regarding meaning, the what, the where, and the how, those sociologists who come closest to addressing the first two questions are Mead, Bloomer, and Goffman. Mead says, man lives in a world of meaning. This is a wonderful quotation and there's absolutely no disagreement uh, that anyone can have with it. So that kind of answers the question one that I mentioned earlier. Bloomer inherits Mead's insights and builds them into a more systematic and empirical discipline based on three premises. Humans act towards things on the basis of meaning. Meanings are formed in the context of interaction. That's where you find the meaning. The use of meanings by a person in his or her actions involves an interpretative process. So on the question of how, Luma's answer is interpretation. Of course, Goffman is probably the one sociologist that has actually come not only very close to talk, but actually engaged with talk. As we can tell from the title of one of his major works, Forms of Talk, Goffman is keenly aware of not only the centrality of language and meaning, and also the locus of meaning production in social interaction, but also the need to look into the details of language in rendering that production visible. The only step, which arguably is the final critical step that he did not take, is the use of naturally occurring data. Okay, so, so to sum up, this uh, section about the sociologists, they've tended to take language for granted. They've been strong on meaning, but weak on form. And why is that so? I think the reason for that is that they tend to have subscribed to a view of language, which makes it seen, but unnoticed, makes it transparent. Like you can see through language to whatever it's supposed to represent. And that is the problem with that view of language. We move on now to the second part. Two theories of language. This is the crux of the problem. The predominant view of language, you might even say the commonsensical view, is one where language is made up of words, let's say a vocabulary, and a bunch of grammatical rules that govern how the words can be put together. Speakers can then use these sentences to convey meanings or thoughts and feelings. Communication is possible between speakers of the same language through the sharing of a code. This model, which is usually referred to as the code theory, uh, is uh, represented in this famous diagram or drawing taken from Saussure's book, Course, of, uh, Course on General Linguistics. According to this code theory, communication is a process whereby a speaker encodes a message, spits it out, hearer receives and decodes the message, and communication takes place. The key to encoding and decoding lies in the linguistic sign which is conceptualized by Saussure as having two sides to it, a signifier and a signified. The signifier, let's think of that as the form, the sound or the writing, the signified is its meaning. A hearer who's presented with a signifier has the task of finding the signified that corresponds to it. This involves something like a lookup operation 
which if successful, will result in the retrieval of the right meaning. The relevant metaphor here then is a code book, such as the Morse code, good for lookups. For the hearer on receiving the form that he's been uh, conveyed to him, he consults the lookup table, let's say a short and a long tap on the code to find A according to this table and this way he gets the meaning. Another way of looking at it is to think of the sign as a box, signs as boxes or containers, where meanings are hidden inside the boxes. The decoder's job is to open the box and see what's inside. And what's inside then will give you the meaning of the word. However, in our everybody's experience, we know that when we see a word, it's not like seeing a box with nothing on it until you open the, the lid. When we see a word, we actually already know what word it is. So that is one problem that we have with the code theory. There are other issues which I will come to as we see some examples later. Okay, here's one example. Uh, for example, we, when we present it with this word Korean, uh, whatever may come to mind may vary from one situation to another. So for example, it may refer to a location or people, maybe nationality, maybe ethnicity, maybe food, maybe language, and many other things. In one of my recordings where uh, a few students are having a chat, one of them uh, asked the other student, are you taking Korean? In that context, on that particular occasion, it's quite clear to everyone, including me who look at the recording and try to do some analysis of it, uh, that Korean in that context refers to the language because they're talking about the language courses that they're taking. Some of them are doing Japanese, others are doing Korean and so on. So in this kind of context, a conversation between university students talking about the language courses, for example, obviously Korean is used here to refer to the language, but there's a whole host of other possibilities uh, without that context or with a different context. Another example is uh, the emojis that we're using a lot these days on our uh, smartphones and so on. Uh, emojis typically don't come with fixed meanings but can be understood differently depending on the context. For example, the hand covering mouth emoji here could mean, oh, I've forgotten or oh, wish I hadn't said that or not allowed to say, and so on, and many other possibilities. And again, I've come across this uh, little emoji several times in different contexts, and they mean different things. Sometimes you're not quite sure exactly what it means. Okay, so one issue with the code theory is that words typically have many senses or uses. Uh, I did a bit of a study of this, uh, just a bit of an experiment. I took the 500 most commonly used words in English from a corpus, I think BNC, and then I consulted the Oxford English Dictionary, and all I did was just count the number of, con uh, the number of senses for each word, each of the 500 words, and I got 14,000 senses, which means that on average, there's 28 senses per word. And this is just the, the tip of the iceberg because as we know, even for OED or any dictionary, uh, the, 
there's no claim to be exhaustive. You know, what you get, what you see there is just a list of the more common senses of these words. So in place of the code theory, we now turn to the second theory now. Uh, Harold Garfinkel came up with the notion of indexicality, which conceptualizes linguistic signs as pointers rather than boxes. First, on the first question of what uh, Garfinkel, like Mead and others, uh, agrees that at least for him, his key preoccupation is an incessant concern with the problem of meaning. Okay, so that's what he says in one of his papers. Um, and, uh, and what is this concept of uh, uh, words and uh, expressions that, that is different from the code theory? This is what um, Miller and Grimwood said about Garfinkel and also later on will introduce Harvey Sachs, their idea of uh, signs, or in fact, what they call indexicals. Words are prone to have multiple uses. The corollary of which is that phrases are naturally incomplete. Talk therefore is always to some extent ambiguous, or at least potentially subject to more than one interpretation. However, rather than seek a remedy to the indexical properties of practical discourse, indexicality itself should be seen as the very thing that facilitates practical understanding. Indexical expressions are not parasites on objectivity, but prime and enabling features of ordinary language itself. So, so indexicality for Kaffin, Colin Sachs is actually central to how words work. So the uh, relevant metaphor here, instead of boxes and containers, is the pointing finger. What are they pointing at? Perhaps they're pointing at the sky, or the clouds, or a bird that we can't see here from our angle. This needs to be worked out in situ, on, on site. Not just what is being pointed out, but why are they doing it? And just to put in a historical footnote here, Harold Garfinkel probably came upon this idea when as a young scholar, he joined a research project led by Fred Strzok at the University of Chicago called the American Jury Project. And in looking at the data of that project, Garfinkel had an eye-opening experience when he realized that listening to the sound recordings and reading the transcripts of the jurors meetings and deliberations, he was struck by how much attention the jurors were paying to not only questions of guilt and innocence, but in moving towards that goal, how concerned they are with questions like fact and fancy and opinion. And questions like, what did he actually say as compared to what he seems to have said or what other people think he said? So turns out then how people say things is extremely important to the question of indexicality. Here's a famous uh, experiment that Kafinko did with an actual conversation that he collected. He showed this to students and asked them to explain step by step what the contextualization processes were that takes one from the words to the senses and the meanings. Because of the time, uh, uh, I won't be able to go through the, the, this in detail. I believe many of you are aware of uh, this study anyway, called the, uh, one of the uh, reaching experiments. Okay, next I would like to just 
make a quick mention of Wittgenstein and uh, Merleau-Ponty as two philosophers whose views are very much in line with this indexicality idea and also whose views we should take into account in trying to understand this new theory of language. Wittgenstein says, every sign by itself seems dead. So it's not the sign that matters to him, but the life that the sign gets when it's used. So he asked this very interesting question, is life breathed into the sign there when it's used? or is the use its life? So the use could actually be the life of the sign. So in the short form, meaning is use, okay? So next, a quick word about Melo Ponty, who says language does not presuppose thought, it accomplishes thought, okay? So this is a very interesting idea. I don't primarily communicate with representations or thoughts, but rather with the speaking subject, with a certain style of being and with the world that he aims at. Okay, so it's a, a rather different view of how signs or words or indexicals uh, are used. For the linguist, actually, the indexicality, the indexicality theory is not very hard to understand because we already know about dikes, indexicals, basically. They refer to the phenomenon wherein, according to Stephen Levinson, understanding the meaning of certain words and phrases in an utterance requires contextual information. So words like pronouns, personal pronouns, words like here, there, now, then, and so on, this and that, today and yesterday. So we all know about this from our introduction to linguistics. Uh, but what uh, Garfinkel means by indexicality theory is that not just certain words and phrases get the meaning from the context, but that every word and every expression does the same thing, needs the context to make any sense at all. It's a bit like what Wittgenstein says, right? Like, until it actually gets used, uh, there's no point talking about what is the meaning or sense of a word until that point when it actually comes to life. Okay, so we got a couple more examples from uh, Sachs about this idea of indexicality. So a short conversation here. When did you have the cast taken off? Tuesday. Sack's question on that one is, why not the 23rd of July, 1968, which presumably was the Tuesday that the speaker was talking about. So why not say that? Or teacher says, how many people don't have paper? And all these students raise their hands. Well, Sack's question is, why not look around and say five and reply, to the teacher's question properly and say five, right? And I'll be there at 9.30. Sack's question is why not 9.32? Okay, so it's got lots of examples like this, which is quite interesting. Okay, so on indexicality, this is one way of uh, understanding it. In the joint publication on formal structures of practical actions, Garfinkel and Sachs argue that sociological reasoning has often aimed to distinguish between indexical expressions whose sense derives from their relation to aspects of the immediate context in which participants use them and objective expressions whose sense is purportedly context-free. Garfinkel and Sachs argue that the quest for objective expressions as in science or any other official activity is endless because such expressions always depend upon an orderliness that necessarily ties them to the situation of their use. Okay, so in essence, then, you know, the indexicality theory not only offers a new perspective on language and on words and meanings, but also actually a reformulation of Durkheim from the sociological point of view, from the sociologist's point of view, what he's doing is to 
reformulate Durkheim's aphorism, as he puts it. And this is how Garfinko proposes to reformulate it. Uh, reformulate it. The objective reality of social facts as an ongoing accomplishment of the concerted activities of daily life with the ordinary artful ways of that accomplishment being by members known, used and taken for granted is for members doing sociology a fundamental phenomenon. So it's not the social fact as given, but the social fact, how is that produced and established? Okay, very quickly now to spend a bit of uh, 10 minutes or so on the third part, which is the symbiosis. Okay, so then uh, we must come back to Harvey Sachs, uh, the inventor of conversation analysis. In this final part of the presentation, I wanna focus on our third question, how, the how question. More than anyone else, Harvey Sachs was the one who took the bold and exciting step of actually working with recordings of naturally occurring conversations. Through his research and lectures, Sachs invented a whole new way of looking at and analyzing language and talk that has grown and flourished to become what is known today as conversation analysis. As an example, and this is my, uh, one of my favorite examples uh, of how CA works taken from Sachs lectures. Let's consider this one. Henry talking to Joe. Henry says, Joe, face it, you're a poor little rich kid. Okay, meant to put Joe down, okay. And Joe's res response to it is, yes, mummy. Okay, so here, yes, mummy is clearly used to carry out an action. The words are not there to refer to anyone, real or imaginary, but to pursue a particular goal in interaction. It's, it's use on this occasion that matters. In his reply to Henry, Joe needs to show through the choice of words and the design and formulation of the term that he recognizes Henry's prior action as an attack, perhaps a playful attack, a playful attack as a move in a game of verbal dueling, but an attack nevertheless. And all of that understanding to be built into the very repartee itself. So if we think back to the code theory and the indexicality theory, when Joe receives the word, uh, sorry, when, when Henry, right? In this case, Joe says mummy. When Henry receives the word mummy, there's nothing for him to look up on his lookup table or nothing to find. Well, there are lots of things to find in the box, but too many marbles in the box for him to know which one to pick if the word was presented to him without any context. But on this particular occasion, when the word mummy is presented to him, it can only mean one thing. It's a repartee, it's a counterattack, right? It's an attempt to put him down, for Joe to put Henry down, uh, and building that action on the basis of the one that Henry did just a moment ago. This is what Sachs says about naturally occurring interaction, why he works with this kind of data. And I quote, it was not from any large interest in language or from some theoretical formulation of what should be studied that I started with tape recorded conversation, but simply because I could get my hands on it and I could study it again and again. So I take it that when he says it's not, it's not he, he didn't have a large interest in language, I take that to mean no theoretical interest in it. It's not looking at the data in order to find some theory of language, but he wants to know how order, for example, is produced in social interaction. He goes on to say, and also consequentially, because others could look at what I had studied and make of it what they could, if, for example, they wanted to be able to disagree with me. 
So that's why he did uh, this, uh, took up the uh, naturally occurring data the way he did. Okay, so now I want to share with you a particular piece of data that I collected some years ago and use that and look at it a little bit, a little more detail so as to further elaborate on what I have said about the index, indexicality uh, view and also the methodology that Sachs has invented for the study of language, meaning, and social organization. So this conversation here between the six friends here took place, I think, in China somewhere. Uh, and these are exchange students visiting one of the universities there. And here they're being asked to sit around and have a chat, OK? So uh, let's just introduce the speakers first. Inga here on the left, Kerry. Uh, notice that he's playing with a little pen uh, in his hands. Anna, see they're all looking at the pen. Lars, uh, this uh, participant didn't say anything on this particular clip, okay, so I'm leaving her out for now. Lars and Mike. Okay, so let's listen to the uh, sound clip here first, the video clip. How do yeah, you keep going like to if you want to? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How do you retract it? Yeah. With uh, the yeah. holder, you, you push the holder down. Yeah. Is it too hard uh, for your brain <laughs> to figure it out? You are so mean. You're Chinese. You're so mean. Yeah, you have to eat that stuff. He's mean. He doesn't want to eat that stuff. Yeah. I don't want to go to Akihabara too. Okay. Right. So here's a transcript of that little bit of conversation. Let's just go through it quickly so as to familiarize ourselves with the terms, which we'll refer back to in a minute. So Kerry, the one who's playing with the pen, says, how do you retract this? Mike, the guy on the right, you, pr you press, right? But he changed his uh, mind. Uh, the holder, you push the holder down. The one there, or the one here. Uh, and then Inga, the girl on the left, then says, is it too hard for your brain to figure it out, and then Anna, the girl on, you know, next to uh, next to Carrie, then uh, says to Inga, "You're so mean. Don't be mean." Meanwhile, Mike, the guy on the right, now says, "You're Chinese. You guys create that stuff." And then Inga is kind of uh, trying to defend herself, I suppose. Uh, let's ignore that bit. And then last, the guy next to Mike then comes in and says, you have to be smart. Okay, so here we have a little chat among a group of students and friends. The episode begins with Kerry, the guy on the left, handling a ballpoint pen and wondering how to retract it. Mike, the guy on the right, comes to his assistance by suggesting to push the holder down. <clears throat> For want of time, let's focus just on lines seven, nine, and 11. <clears throat> in line seven, perhaps following Inga's lead in teasing Kerry, Mike addresses Kerry and reminds him of his nationality. You are Chinese. What in the world could this mean? If Kerry is Chinese, which we don't actually know because I think he's from the US or Canada or somewhere, uh, he looks Chinese and he could actually be of Chinese heritage, but I don't know, we don't know. Nevertheless, we can see from this conversation that as far as Mike is concerned, Kerry is Chinese, okay? That's why he says, you're Chinese. But what is the point of telling someone who is Chinese that he is Chinese? Okay, that is our question. Uh, the point I submit is to create a puzzle. Okay, so to tell someone who he is to his face, I think obviously creates a bit of a puzzle for him and perhaps for everybody else around him. The answer to the puzzle will become clear in the immediately following utterance. In line nine, the puzzle is resolved. 
you guys create that stuff. Now the connection between being Chinese and not knowing how to retract the pen now becomes clear. China or the Chinese people are known for making and selling these pens all over the world. And since you're a member of that group, <clears throat> you ought to know better with this pen than to ask me for help and support and instructions, <clears throat> according to Mike. So if we follow the logic of, to go back to the code theory again, comparing and contrasting the code theory with the uh, indexicality, if we follow the logic of code theory, when Kerry hears the word Chinese, he should open the little box and so on, right? But it's not gonna work. What is he gonna find? He's gonna find a whole jumble of things as we saw with the Korean example. Okay, black hair, black eyes, whatever, you know, Chinese characters. There's no telling which of these things is relevant, but in this context, in order to make that word relevant and has a meaningful sense, then we need to connect it up with the rest of the situation so that it will actually make the sense that it does. The sense of Chinese in this case, then is not given in advance, but depends crucially on what is going on at this point in time, on this occasion. The sense of it, notice, is made at the same time as a context is created that links the Chinese people to the making of pens. This then is the relevant sense of Chinese, which emerges at the same time as the context is produced. With this puzzle, Mike manages to highlight the irony of the situation. Someone who should know a lot more about pens is unable to handle the pen. The point of that is, of course, to tease Kerry. Note how the recognizability and intelligibility of teasing as an action, as an activity, as a scene, is done through the joint production of context, senses of the indexicals, and the meaning of the actions all at the same time. These aspects of the phenomenon of teasing, we can all see teasing going on. Presumably the participants in this interaction can also see that something called teasing is going on. All these different aspects, all these different elements that add up to the recognizability and intelligibility of this thing, this phenomenon called teasing, are all mutually explicate, explicative and mutually elaborative of one another. They kind of support each other. And so it turns out, and we knew this anyway, but it turns out that teasing therefore as a social action, as social interaction, is actually a way of talking a way of saying something. It's the talking that constitute the teasing. So for example, bringing up and pointing out someone's nationality is a way of drawing attention to certain category bound attributes to use Sachs words and concepts and through that to exhibit the irony of the situation. Because one of the attributes of being Chinese in the sense of nationality is the making and selling of pens, for example. And so for teasing to happen, we, we need to get the talk done right, if you like. For example, to order the two utterances, the two sentences, in such a way that the one that is about the identity of the addressee comes first, which creates a puzzle. And then the solution comes after that, which points to the irony, which then constitutes 
and drives the teasing. From teasing, therefore, we can see how talk and social order or social organization turn out to be two sides of the same coin. On one side, you see teasing, the other side, you see the talk. It's actually the same thing. One way of looking at this uh, accomplishment is to contrast this approach to the study of language and meaning with uh, ordinary language philosophy. Okay, this is taken from the same paper that I mentioned a little while ago by Miller and Grimwood. And this is how they contrast CA with OLP. The two key potential contributions CA to the philosophy of ordinary language are, one, conversational propositions themselves are only given meaning within a dialogical sequence, <clears throat> which is invariably highly nuanced and conditioned according to the contextual detail. So there's a dialogical dimension to it, which is often not explicitly attended to <clears throat> in OLP. Secondly, the very limits of this context are themselves constructed within the conversation. And indeed, there's the, also the difference that in CA, while in CA, we use naturally occurring interactions as data, in OLP, we typically use invented sentences. Okay, so here's a quick conclusion summary on the question of what we agree with me, we're living in a world of meaning. On the where, we agree with the symbolic interactionists and many others in sociology, meaning is a joint achievement in interaction. But we need also to know how to study these things. And for that, we need a theory of language that is built upon indexicality and a realization that the procedure of meaning production involves the simultaneous and in situ production of context and senses at the same time on the basis of index accords. In a book on uh, sociology, Raymond Bouton <clears throat> has this to say about sociology, which I find quite interesting. The term society is precisely as useful for sociologists as the term life is for biologists. An empty regulatory term that describes the final asymptotic goal of their research. I suggest that the same can be said about linguistics, about the usefulness or lack of of the term language for linguists. So here's a quick conclusion. Language and society are mutually constitutive and mutually elaborative in a fundamental way. Together, the sociologists and linguists can explore the realm of meaning and expression in ways that only they are qualified to do. And for example, not to be done by the natural scientists in the STEM fields. Let me end with a little picture that hopefully will summarize the perfect fit between talk and social order in this yin-yang kind of uh, diagram. Thank you. Okay, uh, KK Lu, thank you very much for your interesting and insightful presentation about you know, how talk and social interaction are inextricably interrelated. Uh, thank you very much. Now uh, it is open to floor and if you have questions, please raise your hand or write in the chat box. Well, uh, I, have a, I have a question uh, for you. Um, mm -hmm. KK Luke, yeah. uh, thank you for your uh, interesting presentation. And uh, you said that sociologists, uh, they are strong on meaning, but weak on form. 
Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on, you know, why you said that sociologists are weak on form? Yes, um, as I said, uh, by form, I meant the uh, mostly uh, talk, okay? Uh, because when we look at meaning, there, there are many um, things that we can study in order to get at the meaning and sociologists have studied all kinds of social phenomena, obviously, but uh, the point at which, uh, as I try to show, uh, meaning actually emerges or, or gets uh, pr produced and built uh, through mostly through, through interaction, but interaction actually in most cases is done through talk and language. Uh, on this particular point, there's relatively little done in sociology that takes you into the talk itself. So as to see how the meaning actually gets realized or produced. Uh, so that part of it is often assumed to be self uh, explaining or, you know, or, or will take care of itself. Somehow the language will take care of itself. <clears throat> That's what I meant. So okay, uh, yeah, I mean, like uh, the Durkheim example, I use that as one example of it. Uh, and if you think of uh, Goffman, Goffman also actually looks a lot at the, uh, the language, um, uh, but short of using uh, naturally occurring data. So there's a bit of a, a gap, a bit, a, a bit of a dis distance between the kind of data that he looks at and uh, naturally occurring data that people in ethnomethodology and CA typically use. Okay, thank you. It's clear to me. Thank you very much. Uh, Kamal, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, uh, hello. Hi. Hi, KK. It's Kamal. Hi, Hi Kamal. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, thanks for your talk. I think it's, uh, it's quite uh, interesting to see kind of uh, the synergies between the linguistic and sociology. Um, uh, actually, uh, my question is uh, adjacent to your talk because you you like have like kind of like a, uh, given us a, a window into a lot of theories and thinkers. I'm just wondering how influential is Jürgen Habermas uh, and his work, the theory of communicative action in some of your thinking and some of your works. As you know, the theory of communicative, communicative action is um, one of the has been listed as one of the top 10 most influential books in sociology <coughs> in the 20th century. And his, like, uh, his works, uh, his uh, concepts on aesthetic discourses, therape therapeutic, explicative uh, discourses has been used to theorize the links between, between the social and also uh, language. Uh, so I'm wondering whether you can say a little bit more uh, on, on this here. Yeah, yeah, thanks, uh, Kamal. Yes, uh, so Habermas is another example, and, and there are uh, other sociologists and, and psychologists as well that who actually uh, do um, pay quite a bit of attention on uh, discourse, on, on uh, dialogue, and, and so on. For example, therapeutic discourse, right? Uh, interviews and chats and conversations between uh, uh, professionals and uh, help seekers and, and so on. And there's no doubt that, uh, uh, as, for example, as, uh, I, what, what, as, uh, as Leboff for linguistics, you know, as uh, what Leboff has done for linguistics, uh, these sociologists and psychologists have also done their bit for their subjects. And I, I don't deny that, but uh, I, I, I still think that, you know, if what I say uh, is right, or at least have, uh, has some uh, validity to it, then there's no escaping from looking at the actual uh, prime, if you like, the primary site of meaning. Mm. I mean, it's, it's one thing to, to talk about, you know, uh, psychological or uh, psychiatric interviews, you know, 
or a therapeutic uh, talk and, and so on. Um, but, but unless you, until you get to the, uh, the meat of it, if you like the meat and the juice of it, you're really just looking at it from the outside. It's kind of like looking, looking at it from a bit of a distance. Uh, and this is the um, feeling I get when I read some of these uh, works. It's, uh, it's interesting and, and even insightful, but as to what the actual mechanism, if you like, you know, what the little uh, bits of procedures are that the uh, participants in that situation actually use in order to produce the meanings and understandings that they, they actually get without thinking about it. It's not like, you know, let me do a lot of, uh, do some logical inferencing here. It's not like that. It's like, you know, when you see like this guy playing with the pen, when the other person says Chinese to him, he just kind of reacts to it directly. There's no, there's no thinking involved in that sense. Uh, so he, he, he feels a bit puzzled. And then when the second sentence comes out, then he realizes that it's his nationality or his presumed nationality, his looks, and the fact of not being able to, to use the pen, then become uh, meaningful, okay? And the context is then created in that, at that moment. And until we get into data like this, it's, 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 it's not possible to, to see how that happens. And I believe in the kind of data that we have, we can actually see the meaning <clears throat> emerge and, and hit, if you like, hit the participants on the scene at that very moment that it forms from that, from that interaction. All right, thanks, Kiki. Yeah, thanks, Kamal. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay, thank you, Prof. K for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, I saw that you mentioned about the dictionary before. In the, when you look, open the, the dictionary and then you list out the sense in the dictionary. But then mm -hmm. uh, after that, we discussed about how meaning can only really appear in the actual context of being used. How do we uh, connect these two uh, fields? between lexicography and the uh, discourse analysis where we look at the meaning in, in the actual context on one hand, and on the other hand, we have to write down the meaning as in right. like the development yes. of dictionary. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, so how I see it is that actually when you see all these senses uh, defined and listed in the dictionary, they're really like a, uh, a summary <clears throat> of you know the many uses of, of these words. Uh, of course, you know the better dictionaries they define those senses in terms of some actual uh, uses of the words, right? That 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 uh, are attested, you know, that are found in some historical documents or that are found in some corpus these days that may include you know, not just written, but also spoken data and, and so on. So it's essentially, it's a summary uh, and uh, kind of um, uh, after the fact, if you like, you know, you, 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 you decide, you know, what those senses are based on the data that, that you have. Uh, but in the actual use of uh, the words in an interaction, then it's a bit more like uh, things are much more open. I think the, the words will come with what I call meaning potentials. Actually, it's a term that Michael Halliday used too, but in a slightly different sense, because he, I don't think he would subscribe to this uh, framework that I'm proposing, uh, but, but he, he did use the term meaning potential. And I like that term very much because it, it suggests to us that when when we when we receive a word, the the potentials are very much open, quite open, 
of course, circumscribed to some degree. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to have so many different words. So when the when the girl points to the sky, certainly she's not pointing to the earth, right? She's not pointing to the land. She's pointing upwards. She's not pointing down downwards. And that's how the pointer works. It, it points you to a certain direction, but as to exactly what it's pointing to, then you got to work it out somehow, okay? So that's the same thing with the, the, the words. You get a word, you receive a word, it opens up a bunch of possibilities for you. It comes with some potentials, which is basically your past experiences with that word. You call upon those experiences and you find those that come closest to this one, which you're now constructing a new context for. And if you find some fit between those, that is the sense of that word. And very often these can be totally new uh, senses relative to the ones that are recorded in the dictionary. And so the dictionary, I mean, these days we have such good corpora and so on and computer uh, equipment and so on. The senses can grow and grow on, and, you know, on a weekly, on a daily basis. Yeah, thank you. Hi, KK. Can Hi. I ask, ask you a question? Yeah, oh. Shirley. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> really brilliant talk, like Anna said on the chat. Thanks. Okay, can I have a quick question about um, uh, the platform for the communication and how does that feature in your theorizing of the re relationship between language and society? So, for example, conversational analysis that you show in a face to face situation versus now we perhaps use um, social media like mm. WeChat or, yeah, um, and vis a vis uh, communication that's happening on the internet using computer. Uh, interface. So all these um, different uh, uh, platforms, mm. uh, if you call, how does that figure in your um, theorizing of the, 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 the relationship between language and society? Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, Thank thanks, you. Shirley. Yeah, very interesting. Of course, these days, everybody's on social media, and there's different platforms. Uh, so uh, I also talk to my students a lot about how to handle uh, these different platforms. So what I think is that the essential framework remains valid, like you know what I just said. Mm -hmm. You can apply that to social media chats mm -hmm. the same way as you apply to face-to-face -face conversations or to emails, right? To other mm -hmm. kinds of right. platforms. Uh, but of course, on the other hand, each platform, each medium comes with its own uh, affordances and constraints and limitations. So, you know, there's no perfect platform. I suppose the most basic one is the face-to-face -face conversation, which probably has been going on for, 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 you know, tens of thousands of years before any of these social new media uh, came along. Uh, but, but, but still, uh, for each given platform, there are, as I say, affordances or poss possibilities. They, some of them bring new possibilities. For example, on the social media platforms now, we have a choice of, a fantastic choice of emojis, right? Like mm -hmm. more than right. you can ever, you will ever need for most people. You know, very fine gradations, you know, a slight smile, a bigger smile, you know, one drop of tears or two drops of tears, you know, they're all different. And it's fantastic. So it gives you mm -hmm. the, the new possibilities. But on the other hand, of course, on most social media, mm -hmm. then you don't have the, the body language, the actual, like the whole body or the face and the upper body mm -hmm. being visible to your uh, interlocutor mm -hmm. in ways that are not uh, possible within the social media platform, right? But, but there are substitutes and replacements for it, there are alternatives to it. There may even be uh, possibilities that go beyond uh, uh, body language. For example, in face-to-face -face situations, perhaps certain parts of our faces or bodies may be blocked from view. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes there are noises and some blockages that make the situation less than ideal or perfect. Whereas on the social right. media platform, you can pick any emoji you want. And as I right. said, you know, there's probably more than you need anyway. So, so you're bound to find some uh, uh, 
diagram or, or drawing that, that, that fits the particular action that you want to formulate and present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, so any other uh, questions from the floor? When I, when I teach my class these days, sometimes the students say, so what, what has this got to, with, to do with sociology? Right? They say, you know, you, you, you're on about uh, talk and linguistics all the time, you know, so what, what, what of the sociology? So I hope today I've said a bit more about that. Uh, uh, and if any of the students is here, um, still has a question, welcome to ask. And thank okay. you. Um, I think uh, Xu Wei Chen uh, raised her hand. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to appreciate the talk. I don't have any question at the moment. Okay, thank Xue. you so much. Yeah, so is, Andre is Andreas there? Hello, KK. Hi, Andreas. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah greetings right. from Hong Kong. Um, I actually have a question. Uh, my question okay. is related to um, communicating uh, conversation analytic uh, research to maybe right. other other communities. So uh, um, when, when CA is applied to uh, maybe healthcare or maybe uh, artificial intelligence or these kind of communities, mm. uh, then a lot of CA work uh, comes in as uh, as sort of in, from from the side and um, is uh, is often seen in relation to other mainstream approaches in, in maybe sociology about theorizing and uh, building theories and what uh, what CA can bring to the table in relation to um, to other theories and how does it actually qualitatively differ from from other ways of doing uh, doing uh, social inquiry. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Andreas. Yes, yeah, so uh, there's actually more and more uh, work being done now uh, using the methodology to look at uh, talk and interaction in a variety of occupational workplace settings and, you know, and training and work and, and so on. So, uh, I think that's that's very good because otherwise CA may give the wrong impression that, that it's only interested in some uh, very uh, minor um, uh, kinds of uh, situations like family dinners, you know, or or uh, you know friendly chats or something. But actually, the same methodology can be used and is being used to study. For example, hospital clinical uh, interactions or science labs, you know, in uh, the academic arena, uh, you know, how do scientists uh, work together as a team and how do they find discoveries? How do, how do they decide that, it's, that they've discovered something, for example, or uh, in workplaces, you know, in uh, organizations. And so in all these settings, I think CA offers a way of taking us into, you know, taking us to the to the ground floor, if you like, you know. So the metaphor I like to use to explain the uh, possible, you know, potential uses of CA is you can look at a company or a school or an organization or a social institution from. Uh, a distance away, for example, a birds, you take a bird's eye view, okay, or you can come down closer to it and you look at the institution or the organization uh, at a, a, a mid distance kind of level. But at some point, it would be nice to get down to the shop floor, the ground level, where people are actually doing things. And sometimes they don't quite know how to do it, you know. And you get all kinds of things that go wrong, things go wrong, things go right. 
And, and that's where the fun starts, you know, is to actually see how the organization, how the school, how the hospital, how the social institutions actually come to life, if you like, okay? And it's in the words that people use that these things come to life in most cases. Of course, in conjunction with, you know, the instruments, the tools, the paraph paraphernalia that typically come with particular kinds of situations like hospitals and banks and so on. But the talk is always there. The language is always there. And that's why I said near, you know, the beginning that, you know, without a good ground level understanding of talk and language, then we can't really understand society or social institutions as we, as, as we know it. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Yeah, I feel uh, there is uh, sometimes it takes a bit of an explanation to uh, to make people appreciate uh, uh, conversation analytic and ethno-methodological work across communities. But uh, yeah, it, it takes certainly some some time and training to appreciate uh, that that approach. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I just wanted to add that you know because sometimes when you're looking at a grain of sand, you might think, well, why, why am I looking at this grain of sand? You know, it's so small and insignificant, right? Why am I not looking at the world or the community or the universe? You know, some big thing, you know, major issues, you know, politics, economy. Sure, but at some point, these things are going to happen at the level of the grain of sand. And if you look at it carefully enough, you may actually find a universe in it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, I think it's already the time is up, uh, but uh, if you, I, we would like to take just one quick uh, final question from the, from the floor and then we'll be done today. Uh, okay, if, if there is no question from the floor, uh, I think it's time to uh, uh, conclude our talk today. And thank you very uh, I, I thank KK Lu for interesting uh, presentation. Also, thank you all of you for participating in this talk. Thank you very much and have a good weekend. Thank you. Have a nice thank weekend. Thank you. Thank you, KK. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kamal. Thank you.